May of 2020. So, uh, and we're still in Isaiah. Uh, today, and we're in chapter 12, so if you want to keep your Bibles open there, that's where we'll be looking. And uh, with the six verses today, next week, I guess I need to warn you, I want to cover ten chapters, so you might want to bring lunch. No, we'll, we'll get out on time for that, but uh, chapters 13 through 23 is God's word to the nations as he just goes down the list, Babylon, Assyria, and so on. But uh, today we're looking at uh, these six verses in chapter 12. And if you think about the world in which Isaiah prophesied and which this book was written in the original audience, they had things like foreign invaders, political rulers that were not worth much, and there's political instability, crises after crises, one after the other. That's the background. That's the context. The people to whom he prophesied and to whom this letter or this book was sent were people who lived in a world where they thought it's just unpredictable, it's out of control. Now think for just a moment, that's a world that's similar to ours as we hear God's word here. Now of course the details are, are different. But uh, the news of our day reminds us that there are always events happening, sometimes maybe closer to us, sometimes far off in the world, that are on a scale that's beyond our, our ability to control them and maybe even to, to fathom these things. Whether the threat is widespread all over the world, whether the threat is an illness or a worldwide economic crisis or whether it's more personal such as an illness that we might face or the death of uh, somebody that's that's dear to us it's an important thing to say if you look here at chapter 12 and verse 2 behold God is my salvation I will trust and will not be afraid for God the Lord is my strength and song and he has become my salvation. See, that's, that's the conclusion that I will trust and will not fear. Those people back that, there needed that. We need that today. Now, before we get into these, 12, these six verses here in chapter 12, let's go back and remind ourselves because this is a major turning point in the book. And let's uh, remind ourselves just generally of what we've seen. There are really three major dis, uh, divisions before we get to chapter 12 that we've seen. The first is chapters 1 through 5. That's the introduction to the book. That's where this nation of Judah is reminded of their wickedness. And he even says it's like somebody that has sores all over their body, just from the top of their head to their feet. It's because of your wickedness, their sin. And judgment is, is coming. In chapter 5, in that first section, chapters 1 through 5, chapter 5 is a song. It's a song of a vineyard. God himself planted a vineyard, he said. In the vineyard, uh, the people of Judah are that vineyard. And he said, I did everything. I cleared the land. I hauled out rocks. I put a tower there. I had a wine press. I expected to find good fruit. I expected to find good grapes. What did I find? I found just rotten all over. And he says, and here's the rottenness. You're the rottenness in the way you're acting. And it has to do a lot with uh, social injustice toward each other. The poor are being oppressed. They don't care about each other. And God said that judgment then is coming because of that. So that's chapters 1 through 5. Chapter 6 is the next major division in this section chapters 1 through 12 and that's that great chapter about where um, the king Uzziah died and yet that, and that's a dangerous time in a nation but Isaiah sees the king on his throne seated on his throne and that's the Lord and so everything he's in control of everything and the king the king the Lord calls Isaiah he says, whom shall we send? <clears throat> and Isaiah says, here am I, send me. And he's to go and he's to, to preach this message. In chapters 7 through 12, the last major division in this section that we're looking at, 
and we've been spending the last couple of weeks, really uh, the Sundays in December, <clears throat> it's Isaiah and the Lord's dealing with one king, and that king is Akaz. And so we, he, he's uh, the grandson of Uzziah. And he's a wicked king, and he has a threat that comes against him. The kings of Aram and the king of Israel. See, he's king of Judah. <clears throat> That's in the south. The king of, kings of Aram and the kings of Judah want to join together in a coalition against him. And Isaiah comes, and God says, don't worry about those. They're just like pieces of firewood that are smoking, and they're going to burn out. Don't get all upset. Trust God. Well, Akaz thinks, I'll trust Assyria instead of the Lord. <clears throat> In fact, God says, ask of a sign that I'll be with you. And he said, I, I won't ask of a sign. And he said, well, I'll give you a sign anyway. And the sign is Emmanuel. Emmanuel. God with us. Emmanuel. <clears throat> God is with us. That sign to Akaz or Ahaz is a sign of judgment. But to those who listen to God, it's a sign of hope. And so Emmanuel is coming. In chapter 7 we have that. In chapter 9 we have the great statement about who this Emmanuel will be and, and the names that he will have. He, he will be this wonderful ruler and peace will be <clears throat> under him. And then in chapter 11 that we saw last week, he is the one who comes from, as God mows through in his judgment and cuts down all the, all the trees and Judah's among them, Assyria and Judah and all these nations. And so you think about a field where you just have stumps. And yet from one of those little stumps, from the stump of Judah, there's a little shoot that comes up. And you look at it and you say, well, I don't think that's going to amount to anything. But from that little shoot... From the line of Jesse will this great king come, and that's the king Messiah. He's Emmanuel. He's the great one that we've been talking about. So that's chapter 11. Now chapter 12 <clears throat> that we're at here is the capstone of this because it's a hymn of thanksgiving and joy. And I've entitled this as Joy to the World. So we looked at Emmanuel in chapter 7. Emmanuel in chapter 7. We looked at uh, the names that this child will bear in chapter 9. A child will be given to us, a son will be born. Then in chapter 11, we looked at he's the shoot uh, out of Jesse. He's David's greater son. And now here in chapter 12, the proper response is thanksgiving. Praise to God. This is one of a number of hymns that's found outside the book of Psalms. We usually think of Psalms hymns and thanksgiving in the book of Psalms. And that's true. You have 150 chapters there, 150 Psalms. But this is one that's outside of that book. There are others, and we're not going through the, the places. In Exodus, there are a couple. In Amos, there are some. Notice here, as you have your, have your Bibles open, <clears throat> it begins, and in that day, in that day, you will say. That phrase, in that day, <clears throat> you will say, or the phrase, in that day, occurs several times in this book. Yet, it has a different tone here. In other places, it has judgment is coming, predicted judgment. Here, that day hasn't arrived yet for Isaiah. It's a day of hope. Now, notice here, in verse 1 of chapter 12, you have, in that day. And then look down at verse 4. What do you have? In that day. And so that divides this chapter into two neat sections. And here's something also that's very interesting about this. In chapter, one, or chapter 12, 1 through 3, <clears throat> verses 1 through 3, In that day you will say, the you there is singular, and all the verbs are singular. Verses 1 through 3, all the verbs are singular. That's an individual. In that day, you, some individual, you will say. In verses 4 through 6, <clears throat> in that day, you will say. The you there is plural. And so that's, that's some people that have joined this individual. And so we have the singular, and then we have the plural. One person, and then, then the nation. In that day, what this is generally saying is, in that day, you've suffered God's judgment, His discipline, <clears throat> 
and you'll discover now that God is no longer angry with you. His anger will be turned to compassion, his judgment to words of comfort. Look at verse 1. In that day, you'll say, I'll give thanks to you, O Lord, because or for you were angry with me, your anger is turned away, and you've comforted me. The word, the Hebrew word comfort means the, it, it allows a person who's been through severe um, circumstances, spiritual stress, external burdens, it allows that person to breathe again. You will comfort me. And then we come to that verse 2 that we read a moment ago. Look, behold, God is my salvation. <clears throat> Notice the verse begins and ends acknowledging that God or the Lord is his salvation. They looked a cause, Ahaz, looked to Assyria for salvation. So you have these two kings that are threatening him, and Isaiah says, trust God. And he says, I won't, I won't look to God. He looked to Assyria. And this Assyria, Tiglath-Pileser was the king at that time, very powerful nation, and he said, they'll rescue me. <clears throat> but you know what happened? Assyria didn't rescue Judah. Assyria turned into the enemy of, of Judah. It's, it's like, if you picture it like, this mob boss, and you have to keep paying the mob boss off. And then and the mob boss says, uh, well, I'm tired of messing with you. And he turns on you. That's the idea. That's, that's what's here. That, that hope faded. But verse 2 looks to the time when Judah will rediscover that their trust is in Yahweh, is in the Lord. That's in contrast to the false salvation that Assyria offers. I will trust and I will not be afraid because God the Lord or Yahweh is my salvation. He's become my salvation. No longer be afraid, he says. <clears throat> now, who is this individual? We're not told. Perhaps it's Isaiah. Isaiah's name means God is salvation. But the end of this uh, verse here and the idea about water as well in verse 3 goes back to, and it's echoing and you have some of these echoes in in scripture at one point I was doing a pretty major study about um, what you might call echoes in, in scripture how that one passage echoes another one now I never did finish it but um, you have that throughout scripture of echoes that occur and when you read a passage and you think, oh yeah, that reminds me of that passage. And the original readers, as they read a passage, oh yeah, that reminds us of what's in Torah. It reminds us of what's in, in we've heard before. This echoes Exodus 15 and verse 2. And that verse says, the Lord God is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. So as they come out of Egypt, they're reminded that the Lord is their salvation. He's, he's the might. He's the great warrior who's, who is more powerful than the Pharaoh of Egypt. And he leads his people out. And so all this is echoing the Exodus events and the deliverance that, that's there. <clears throat> it anticipates. And in Isaiah, you have this deliverance is like a second Exodus where God's leading his people again. He's not leading them through the Red Sea as he parts the water. He's leading them through the desert. But still the same ideas are, are that he's leading his people. Then we have verse 3. Therefore, therefore, based on these things, that God is my, I'll trust in him, he's my salvation, with joy. And that's why I, I, uh, I gave the title of this lesson here, that uh, joy to the world. Therefore, with joy, you'll draw out water out of the wells of salvation. Wells are very important in, in biblical times. So, I mean, most places like Egypt, you had the Nile, that's the, that's the lifeblood to, to Egypt. Assyria had Tigris and Euphrates. Um, Israel's pretty, uh, I mean, from one end to the other of Israel, it's, it's pretty broad landscape, differing landscape. 
And uh, yet, if they if it didn't rain, you know, you'd have drought in the land. They didn't have a great river like the Nile or the Tigris and Euphrates. And so, I'll draw out water from these from the well of salvation. And water, as you know, is a significant picture in Scripture. How that uh, even in the beginning in Genesis two, that God waters the whole surface of the ground. And you remember Jeremiah. Jeremiah tells the people, you've forsaken living water and you've hewn out cisterns. <clears throat> cisterns are places, you know, you store the rainwater, store the water for the dry season. By the way, Palestine has two seasons. Dry season, rainy season. That's it. In the dry season, doesn't rain at all. Rainy season, you have the early rains, the later rains, but in dry season, doesn't rain. And so they depended on those cisterns, but Jeremiah says, your cisterns, have, or they leak, they're broken because you haven't trusted in God. So wells were very, very important. They're highly prized. Cities were, or towns would be built with wells. Battles have been fought over wells because who controls that well? You have, you have life. And so Isaiah is following this community in its journey from Egypt, symbolically, as they take shelter at this well, and this well, and this well. And I'll say a little bit more about that in just a second. Look at verses 4 through 6. So now we've had the individual in verses 1 through 3. How that He says, I'll give thanks. I'll praise God. And all this is because of Emmanuel, the child that's given, the son that's born, this shoot of David. Now in verse 4, in that day, as in verse 1 we heard, in that day... This is a communal song. The, the you here in verse 4, you will say, is plural. It's like a, a whole bunch of people now have joined this one person in singing this chorus of, of praise. That one person's no longer alone because all these other people have joined them in saying, I'll praise God. Give thanks to Yahweh. Call on His name. And when that day comes, when it finally arrives, they will have this gift of, of freedom. Verse 4, the latter part there, declare his doings among the peoples. Proclaim his name. His name is exalted. The peoples here probably are Gentiles, and the idea probably is that God's people, Israel and Judah, are to show God to the nations. Israel was God's chosen nation in this line of Abraham. And their work was to show God to the people around them, to the nations. They didn't, they didn't view it that way. They viewed it that God is, is our God and he's not the God of anybody else. And you read that like Jonah. I mean, God sends him to, to Nineveh and Jonah goes the complete opposite direction. He doesn't want to share his God. He's our God. He's not anybody else. He's certainly not the God of Nineveh or the Assyrians. <clears throat> so this mission... It's, we're reminded of this here to declare God's doings among the peoples. Proclaim that God's name is exalted. And sing to Yahweh for he's done excellent things. Let it be known in all the earth. Cry aloud, you inhabitant of Zion. And so that's recapping this emphasis on singing these praises because of what God has done. Zion <clears throat> is literal place. That's the mountain on which Jerusalem was built but it turns into a spiritual idea. And we sing songs, we're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. God dwells in Zion. He built the temple there. And so figuratively it turns into this big spiritual idea. Now look at the last verse. <clears throat> you shout, you inhabitants of Zion, because great is the Holy One of Israel. That's Israel's God. That's our God, the Holy One of Israel. That phrase, Holy One of Israel, occurs 31 times in the Bible. But six of those times are outside of Isaiah. So that means you have 26 times in Isaiah, out of 31 times, that this phrase, Holy One of Israel, occurs. It's a favorite phrase of Isaiah. It's very significant. Holy means set apart. God is set apart. <clears throat> he's set apart from Israel. He's set apart from us. 
but God invites us into his holiness. He's, we, when we're holy, we're set apart. And by the way, if I had a chalkboard or th something to write on, we could put the words holy, saint, sanctify, sanctification, holiness, all those come from the same root in Hebrew and also in Greek. And it means to be set apart from the common. So if you're a child of God, you're a saint. You're set apart. You're holy. When did that happen? It happened at your conversion. You were washed. You were justified. You were sanctified. You're set apart. That's what Paul tells the Corinthians. So we're saints. Sometimes people say, well, I'm no saint. Well, if you're a child of God, you're a saint. And, and especially Paul, the ethics that Paul teaches is live like who you are. You're a saint, so live like a saint. And so he writes to the Corinthians and he says, you can't live the way that you, you're living because you're a saint. You're, you've been sanctified. Uh, a lot of theologians use the illustration of um, uh, two people who are unmarried, a man and woman who are unmarried, and they fall in love and then decide to get married. And when they get married, their status has now changed. They were unmarried, now they're married. Now, married people can't live like unmarried people. If married people act like unmarried people, then there are problems. And so saints can't act like people who are not saints. We've been sanctified. We're called to live in holiness. Live like who we are. Now we're saved by grace. It's not our goodness that makes us a saint. So we're saved by God's grace through the gift of, of the sacrifice of Christ. But we're called to live up to this high standard that we have. Now we can in this life, but <clears throat> we're called to keep our eyes on Christ, to live like Him. Alright, so we looked at verses 1 through 3, and then we looked at 4 through 6. The individual, and then the, the uh, chorus, or the, all the others joining together. And if you have the individual, verses 1 through 3, it seems the middle verse, verse 3, the verse that ties these two sections together is, With joy you'll draw from these wells of salvation. And historically, this was probably recited at the Feast of Tabernacles, and they would go and they'd take water, uh, jars of water, and take it on Temple Mount and then pour it out and even say this, this verse. But notice the emphasis on drawing water with joy. And as I mentioned, that joy is the Christ child. That joy is Emmanuel. That joy is in the line of David. That joy is the Messiah. That joy is Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, notice it's wells of salvation. You, with joy, you'll draw out of the wells. That's plural. It doesn't say well says wells <clears throat> and somebody might say okay well that's teaching us that there are many ways of salvation you can go this way you can go that way and and that's what i want to believe because i've all i've all, always believed that and now here's a verse i can use to uphold that that's not what this is teaching that there are many ways of salvation because scripture teaches there's one way of salvation and that's through christ He's the name that's given under heaven whereby we should be saved or must be saved. So there's one way of salvation. Why is it wells instead of well? And this doesn't, it's not original with me. It comes from somebody else. But I thought it was really good. Uh, this person said, why wells? They say, well, if you're crossing a desert, say, from Egypt to the promised land, there better be more than one well. There better be a well in Egypt as you get started or nearby, and there better be a well at the end or near the end at the Jordan. And along this route, there better be various wells. And so as they're journeying along, they drink from the wells of salvation. Now, it's already, he's already told us that God is salvation. And so what's the picture? The idea is taking a deep drink, putting your face into the water of the wells, and drinking from, from God. And these wells of salvation are the places and the times where we draw near to God. And we have various wells throughout our life. At various times, I'm sure we're closer to God. That's a well of salvation. And he says, I praise God for those wells. He's the fountain of, of living water. And because we drink from those wells of salvation, 
back in verse 2, we will trust and not be afraid. You remember what the angels said in Luke 2 that a lot of people think of at this time of year? Do not be afraid, the angel said. I'm bringing you good news of great joy for all people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. That's that joy. That's that joy that this, this psalm Verse, uh, this chapter 12 is celebrating. And that, that pattern of praise hasn't changed. <clears throat> we sing of God's forgiveness. We sing of His comfort. We sing of His strength. We sing of His freedom. Our song is salvation. And we, we sing that. That's our, that's our life. And in receiving this as well, this gift of, of Emmanuel, of Messiah, that's to be shared. Tell the nations, he says. Tell everybody about that message spreads all over the world and we're going to sing a song that Jim announced as an invitation song so we delight in Messiah as the joy of our salvation <clears throat> another person and I'm not going to go back and re-preach this but another person put it this way if you like things like this we delight in God because there's joyful pardon verses 1 through 3 there's joyful proclamation verses 4 and 5, and there's joyful presence in verse 6. But it's focused in giving thanks on Christ in sending Emmanuel, the child, the son, the root of David, this great king, everlasting father. This morning as we sing this song, if you haven't drank from the wells of salvation, then we invite you to turn from sin and repentance, confess the name of Jesus, and come to Him in living faith, being immersed. So you die to sin. Baptism is, is, has many pictures in, in New Testament. One of those is a burial. So you die, you die to sin, and you're buried. But you don't remain in the grave because you're raised up. So now, the old person's dead, the new person lives. You're now a saint. You're now a holy person. If you've done that and you're not living the way that you should be living, that old person is, uh, is still living, then you need to come back. You need to rededicate yourself. You need to, once again, drink from these wells of salvation. It's our prayer. If you need to come, you'll do that as we stand and sing.